Hi, my name is Michelle, and today I'm going to be talking about the cost of misinformation in the beauty space. So my formal education is in chemistry. My professional background is mostly in science education. I'm the founder of Lab Muffin Beauty Science, where I explain the science behind cosmetics and personal care products in layperson terms on my blog, YouTube channel, and on social media. And I've been doing this for about 10 years. My content mostly explains how products work and how to use them more effectively. And a lot of this involves debunking misinformation. Myths come up all the time. There's always new stuff about sunscreen being harmful. Benzene in sunscreens was a recent one. Some misinformation is actually perpetuated by seemingly authoritative sources. And this is always really challenging to debunk because you need your audience to understand how to critically assess sources and look at the actual data. So for example, you might've heard that sunscreens are getting banned because they're bleaching coral reefs. But this is actually based on studies where coral was spiked with way more sunscreen than you'd actually find in the ocean. When I first tackled this topic in 2018, I had to convince people they should listen to my interpretation of the data backed up by tweets from one of the top coral scientists in the world, but still tweets, opinion pieces from coral scientists, and a coral science mailing list. On the other side, you had peer-reviewed studies, you had incoming laws banning sunscreen and the NOAA. So this was a bit of a hard sell, but I think I managed it quite well. Thankfully, earlier this year, a couple of academic reviews came up backing out my argument, which has made my job a lot easier. Also, one of the authors of this particular review actually follows me on Instagram and backed me up, which was really helpful too. Another example is that chemical sunscreens absorb UV while physical sunscreens reflect. And this is what most dermatologists say, which makes sense because this is what the American Academy of Dermatology says on their website and every dermatology textbook out there. But how UV interacts with metal oxides is actually physical chemistry and not dermatology. There's no skin involved. Physical chemists have known for a really long time that small metal oxides um, the really small particles, like what's in sunscreen, they mostly work by absorbing UV. And here you can also see one of the big issues that many science communicators deal with when they come up against misinformation. The myth is usually nice and simple, but the science is complex and messy. It's usually a lot easier to explain myths than to explain science. You can see that in Brandolini's Law. I think the most important thing to convince someone is you need to give them an explanation that makes more sense than their current misconception. And that's hard because you're going against confirmation bias and you have to make this new information fit in with their worldview. I think my background in teaching really helps a lot here. I've had a lot of experience in face-to-face -face teaching where you can see students give real-time feedback to your explanations. And you end up building a toolkit of really effective teaching techniques. So explaining the same thing in lots of different ways, getting right to the root of a misunderstanding, and then going back and tidying up all the little bits so everything makes sense again. In the early days, I had a lot of scientists and beauty marketers telling me that people who use beauty products don't care about science. I think I've proven them wrong. Some of my numbers are here. Science can be intimidating, but the fact is no one wants to waste time and money on stuff that doesn't actually work. And lots of people realize that science is a really good way of navigating this. But for a really long time, people didn't try to explain this stuff properly to consumers. You can see some of the press coverage I've gotten. A lot of the journalists interviewing me have mentioned that they actually are consumers of beauty products themselves. Beauty is a massive market there's lots of potential for science communication there. And now I'm lucky enough to do this as my full-time job. One of my main funding sources is sponsorships with brands. At the start, they mostly got me to do reviews, pretty standard stuff for influencers. But as I got better known, brands started approaching me to specifically make content that just explained the science behind their products or debunked misinformation. So brands are increasingly willing to invest money into debunking misinformation because it's costing them. When consumers believe the seductively simple myths, multinational brands have teams of scientists making sure their products are safe and effective, but just making safe and effective products isn't enough anymore because misinformation is spreading much faster now with social media algorithms. Here's an example of a video I made for Pantene. 
Can you check for silicone buildup by scraping your hair with scissors? I did an experiment to find out. I washed two samples of hair with clarifying shampoo to remove buildup. Then I put Pantene conditioner on one sample, dried them, then scraped both with scissors. White stuff came off on both samples. This is what it looks like through a microscope. They look pretty similar. So it's not buildup from conditioner. What is this white stuff? If you look through a stronger microscope, the white stuff looks like scaly roof tiles. The outside layer of your hair, the cuticle, is clear and looks like roof tiles. So scraping your hair is literally scraping off part of your hair. And afterwards, this is what your hair looks like. Don't do it to your hair. So this scrape test was spreading on social media as a way to disparage Pantene as cheap crap and get people to buy more expensive products. So Pantene asked me and a few other beauty science influencers to debunk it. They gave us these microscope images. Here's another example of misinformation that's led to some serious problems for companies, clean beauty. The idea is that products need to be free from certain ingredients that are supposedly harmful to your health, according to in vitro and animal studies, but human studies have repeatedly found little or no health effects. If you're familiar with drug discovery, then you'll know that clean beauty doesn't make sense because if things worked in humans like they do in cells and animals, then we would have cured cancer a million times over by now. One class of ingredients that's being commonly fear-mongered about are parabens, and these are preservatives that are supposedly linked to breast cancer. To understand the clean beauty problem, I think it helps to know the way the beauty industry works to make a product. A product developer first gathers market intelligence, what consumers want, to produce a brief. And sometimes there are scientists involved at this stage, but usually not. They're usually going off what consumers think, and this is backed up by slick marketing from places like the EWG, which is a really common source of misinformation. You might know about them from natural food. The brief then goes to the scientists who formulate a product that matched the requirements of the brief. So the scientists, even though they know full well from not very slick looking scientific sources that parabens are fine, they still have to make a paraben free product. So the problem here is that the tail is wagging the dog. What consumers want determines how the product gets marketed and the marketing angle is decided before the product even exists, before it goes through any scientists. This becomes a positive feedback loop. Advertising from billboards, TV ads, brand spokespeople and influencers reinforce and confirm the misinformation that the consumer already sort of knows. This clean beauty pseudoscience started with smaller brands, but this is a very simple marketing fiction. It's taken hold so much that even giant beauty conglomerates who employ thousands of scientists who can tell them that parabens are perfectly safe, they're still using this strategy. And if these giant conglomerates are reinforcing the message that parabens are bad, then as a consumer, you're going to believe that they're bad. So you might be wondering, what is the problem here? The next part in product development is testing, and this includes microbial testing. Cosmetics are really good food for bacteria and fungi. If you use a contaminated product on your skin and get an infection, you're probably going to sue the company. Parabens are really effective preservatives that kill microbes. You only need a tiny amount, so there's little risk of irritation and allergy, and there's a really long history, almost a century of safe use. So if you take out these parabens, you're going to have to replace them with other preservatives. And these other preservatives don't work as well. This is blindingly obvious to the scientists who do the testing. These preservatives also cause more skin reactions. They have unknown long-term health effects. So the result is brands are being forced by misinformed consumers to stop using preservatives that they know are safe and effective because of a BS reason. This leads to longer R&D times, it opens the brands up to liability if a consumer sues over an infection. And this is happening with lots of other safe and effective ingredients. I've actually consulted with a few large companies specifically about how to debunk this clean beauty misinformation. And the fact they're hiring me for this shows that it's impacting their bottom line. Now, it isn't just private companies that are hurting from misinformation. I talk a lot about sunscreen, and I think that's a topic where the cost is pretty obvious. Sunscreen is an anti-cancer drug in the US and Australia, and social media myths about it being bad for you or for the environment or telling you how to use it incorrectly, obviously these all lead to public health impacts and cost to society. But there are more subtle impacts as well. Clean beauty and ingredient fear-mongering is actually why I picked beauty as my topic area rather than quantum computing. 
because the same people who are making decisions on what beauty products to buy are also making decisions on whether or not to get vaccinated and often whether or not to get their children vaccinated. You don't have to believe in cosmetic science to see the parallels between this sort of misinformation. If you're worried about what you're putting on your skin in terms of toxins, then you're not going to want to inject these toxins either. And if you dig into the people who are pushing clean beauty myths, they're often pushing anti-vax myths as well. One of the main inspirations for me to start science communication in the first place is the excellent blog Science Based Medicine. They have lots of articles debunking vaccine misinformation. And I saw so many science communicators trying to tackle these topics. But by the time someone doesn't trust mainstream medicine, it's really hard to change their mind, especially when it's about a topic as emotionally loaded as the safety of their children. So I thought, what about further up the pipeline? If I could inoculate people against this sort of logic when they're less combative, then maybe they won't fall for it when it's a much more important topic. I've had a lot of success with debunking clean beauty misinformation. There are a lot of people who have told me that they don't believe in clean beauty anymore. And I do get comments where people have drawn the parallels with vaccine misinformation. So what are my main takeaways, I guess? Um, people have an appetite for learning. Everyone wants to learn more. I think this is an innate part of human nature. There are lots of science communication opportunities, especially in areas that are more neglected and emerging. So. I think that's actually where there's more opportunity because it's a lot less saturated and you can reach a lot more people that way. Debunking misinformation can also have long range impacts in unrelated fields and you need to have creative thinking and willingness to experiment and empathy if you want to be good at effectively communicating the science.